thank you so much. Well, let's see if all right. Boom. All right, guys, we gotta look into this. I'm not saying, Tom. Well yeah, I thought I thought that, Tom. <laughs> Got it? All right. This young man here, we're going to vote at the end of the service to license him to preach. Now, in Baptist life, that's what a man does when he announces his call to preach. We license him, and then we view his gifts. We watch him very carefully. We listen very carefully. He has to meet with the pastor three or four times a week for counsel. <laughs> I'm joking. <clears throat> and then after we view his gifts for a particular time, uh, we'll vote to ordain him and send him out. And I think that's one of the greatest things that can happen to a church, is that a man gets called to preach and we get to license him and ordain him. I uh, just thank the Lord for that. I remember my time going through that. And it was a trying time, but it was a great time as well. So be praying about that, if you will. <clears throat> now, I want you to be praying for... Um, Cheryl's dad, uh, they would like for him to have surgery, but he said he's not going to do it, and he's going to go to the doctor tomorrow. So please pray for him, and then pray for uh, Cheryl and for Susie, that the Lord will bless them. Susie stayed with us last night. Frankly, I had forgotten what it's like to have a girl living in our home. I've got a, a wife for many years, but it's sort of like having a daughter again. I've never known a girl can spend an hour and a half putting on makeup. <laughs> not sitting, not sitting on the bureau, not not standing, sitting in front of the bureau, sitting on the bureau. <laughs> love you, Susie. I, I really love you. <clears throat> All right, now. In Galatians chapter 2, we're going to be again reading in verse 11. <clears throat> and then we're going to go over to chapter 11 and 12 of the book of Hebrews. We're talking about this matter of living unto God. Living unto God. That's a very important subject. Think of the men and women in the Bible that gave their all to live for the Lord. I mean literally gave all. I mean coming down to the end of life and being martyred, giving their life for the Lord Jesus Christ. What would we do if we were called on to do that? I wonder what our decision would be. So first of all, beginning here in the book of Galatians 2, we'll begin reading in verse 11. <clears throat> But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For therefore that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch as that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not spiritually or uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, Before them all, If thou being a Jew, livest thou the manner of the Gentiles, and not as to do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Notice that Paul did not uh, hesitate to look Peter right in the face publicly and tell him that he was wrong. Sometimes that's the best thing you can do for a man or a woman is you can tell them they're wrong. In Christian love, of course. And of course, I would suggest that you be a Christian of some years. I don't think a novice should be able to do that, but I think a seasoned veteran, a man or a woman, could do that. And so here is this man being confronted to the face because he was to blame. 
Now in verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is justified by works of the law, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even as we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by no works of the law shall any fl no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I myself a transgressor. Now watch verse 19. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Now I want to add verse 20 to that. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now look at verse 19 again. For through the law I am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. God. Let me ask you this question this morning. Who are you living unto? What are you living for? What am I living for? Now go over to chapter 11 and chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews. Now let's bow our heads and pray before we look into these verses <clears throat> and we talk about this matter of living unto God. Let's bow for a few moments and ask the Lord to speak to our heart. Here's what I want you to do. While I'm praying, I want you to pray. And I want you to ask the Lord to reveal to you anything that might be in your life that's hindering your pleasing Him. Ask Him if there's anything you need to do that would make you enhance your Christian life so that you could take the gospel to the world and make a difference in the lives of others. Now take just a moment... And I'll give a little silence and then I'll pray. But please ask the Lord to speak to your heart. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, our subject is very important. And we would ask this morning that you would help us to remember that serving God is a very serious thing. We've been bought with His blood. We'll go to heaven because... We have been redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And now you have left us here on this earth to take the gospel to the world. I thank you that this church supports 30 missionaries. And we want more missionaries coming in. We want to add that to that we can. And Father, I pray that you'll help us to understand that our mission is to lost souls. Our mission is to the world. Now, Father, speak to our heart this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, back in Hebrews chapter 11, notice verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, watch that verse. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you want to be the best Christian that you can be, what he's saying is this, you and I need God's working in us to put within our heart and in our life that which is needful so that we might be able to give ourselves to him. He would use us to touch the lives of people and there would be evidence to the world through us that God is real. Think about that for a moment. God wants in you and in me to have evidence by the way we live, by the way we talk, where we go, how we conduct ourselves. Are we seen in church occasionally or are we faithful? Do we ever witness to anybody? Do we carry our Bible with us or New Testament with us to witness to people? How many times in the last month have you walked up to someone and said, Sir, ma'am, I'd like to give to you a gospel track and I'd like for you to read it. I'd like for you to go to heaven one day if you're not a believer. 
Do we do that? The Bible says go into all the world and preach the gospel. And it says beginning at Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is right here. This is our Jerusalem. And so he says, now faith is the substance. And God has given you and I the substance that's needed to do what we're called to do, but we've got to do it. Practice it. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then he goes through this chapter, and he uses the same word again and again, through faith, in chapter 3. And you can just go on and on. Verse 8, through faith. And uh, just down to chapter, or verse after verse. Uh, verse 20, uh, by faith. Verse 21, by faith. Verse 22, by faith. And on and on. Verse 27, on and on, by faith. So faith is that substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How's your faith life? How is my faith life? Do you believe in God? Do you believe God can use you to change this world? Do you believe that God can use you to bring men and women to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, here a while back we looked at the judgment seat of Christ where we will stand and give an account of our life to Him. That's going to be a sobering moment, isn't it? Now just think with me for a moment. I'm coming before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The one that gave his life for me. The one that shed his blood for me. That I might have everlasting life. And I'm going to stand before him one on one. And I will give an account to him for the deeds that I have done in my body here on this earth. Now the sins that we have committed and confessed, they're forgiven. Think with me now. Isn't that a wonderful God? We ask him truthfully, in tears many times, Lord, I failed you again. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And you know what he does? He does. And as far as the east is from the west, he removes our transgressions from us. They will be remembered no more. But what about the rebellion that's not confessed? The rebellion that's not set aside? The lack of faithfulness that, that has just not permeated itself in our life. And I could go on and on and on. Now chapter 11 is a story, if you will, a, a, a true one, but it's a story of men and women who serve God. Men and women who live by faith. Men and women who God used to turn the world upside down. I've been doing this thing for a long time. I've been preaching a long time. I uh, can sometimes stand in the pulpit and look over the congregation. It's pretty, pretty easy for me from time to time to know where a person's listening or not. Sometimes I know when I'm not in the groove, if you like for me to say it that way. But we need to know where we are spiritually. Because we're going to stand before Him and give an account. Picture it now. It's just the Savior and you. It's just the Savior and me. I don't know what he's going to say. The Bible doesn't give us any indication. Maybe he'll say something like this. Welcome home, my child. I'm so glad that you're here. Now let's review your life. I want to say, here, look at this. You were so in touch with me at this time. We had sweet fellowship. You opened your morning by speaking to me. You closed your day by speaking to me. Oh, I remember those times that the preacher called you to the altar to lead that man to the Savior, to me. I remember when the Lord called you, young lady, dear sister, to the altar, and the pastor said, would you deal with this lady here? She wants to be born again. And you led that person to the Lord. Or it would be a man or a woman and he would say something like this. Remember when you walked down that aisle with that young man? Or with that young lady, you walked down the aisle 
Tears was in her eyes or his eyes. You walked to the platform and you knelt down. You opened your New Testament and you showed her the Roman road, the way to, to salvation. Ah, oh, do you remember that time when you were in the mall and you were giving out tracts? And this young lady walked up to you and she took the track and you were speaking to her and right there in that mall, you asked her, if I could take my New Testament and show you how to be saved, would you do it? And she said, yes. And in that mall, you led that young lady to the Lord or a young man. And then he would say something like this, you know, I want to reward you for this. You've already laid your crowns at my feet as a token of your love for me and your affection for me. And now, these rewards that you have, you're going to enjoy the benefit of them even though you give them to me throughout the endless ages of eternity. But then he might say something like this. You remember when you were that little, with that little group of men or that little group of ladies and some language and was not good, but you joined in with it. And you laughed at it. And you even used profanity yourself in front of these unsaved people. I'm just trying to paint a picture for myself and for you of the fact that one day we will stand before Him. I will and you will. Now I don't know about you, but when I mess up, I want to run to my prayer tower as quickly as I can and get on my knees and say, Lord, you knew, you saw it, I blew it. I blew it and I am sorry, I really am. I don't want to do it again. Please forgive me and help me. Now I said all of that to say this. We need to live our life unto the Lord. Who are you living for? Whom are you living for? What are you living for? What makes you tick, all right? Spiritually. Now, let's go over to chapter 12. Now, these men and women that are spoken of here in chapter 11 were the men and women that lived under the God. Now, did they make their mistakes? Yes. Did they fail? Yes. Just like you're going to fail. Just like I'm going to fail. But aren't you glad if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you glad of that? Now look at chapter 12. I love these verses. And they ought to spur you on. I'd read this chapter day after day after day. But look at verse 1. Wherefore, now when you see a wherefore in the Bible, find out what the wherefore is there for. What he's saying is this, because of what I have just said, because of what I have just said, now I personally believe Paul was a writer. You may disagree, but I believe he was the writer. I, I'm not going to get into that, but uh, that's neither here nor there. So because of what I have just said, you understand the connection. Now look at verse 1. Wherefore, because of what I have just said, seeing we also are compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. Now let's stop there for a second. I don't want to get in a hurry with this. It's just so important. Patience. We ought to pray for patience every day. I woke up this morning thinking about the day. And I'm going to just tell you the truth. I wanted to get out of bed, get, get a shower, get going because I look forward to coming to church. I look forward to Sunday. I look forward to being with God's people. And the devil begins to put some thoughts in my mind to discourage me. Now I want you to listen. The closer you get to God, the closer you walk with Him, the more Satan's going to be on your back. Man, you've heard me say many of a time, He knows you well. He has a book on you. 
He has a book on me. He knows my besetting sin. With a man, it might be in the area of, of lust. And for ladies, it may be some other things, but he knows that thing that Satan uses to attract us. He knows that one thing that he can usually count on. Now remember, he has you followed every day with his demon hordes every day, observing you, observing me, finding out our weaknesses, throwing into our... By the way, did you know that Satan has the power to put in your mind thoughts? The Bible says, Satan having put into the mind, into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray the Savior. Satan put it there. Satan has that ability to put, to throw into your mind and mine those things to pull us away. I woke up this morning looking forward to getting up and getting going and getting to church. I love to be in church. I love to be with God's people. Did you notice the laughter this morning? There's nothing wrong with that among God's people. We can enjoy one another. And I enjoy the banner back and forth that we have. I also enjoy it when a member has a, a wife or a husband die. And the church just pulls around them. I walk out that door a many of a time in the front of a casket. A mother. A dad or a grandmother. Many of you will never know what that's like because God hadn't called you to pastor or preach. And I knew that man, that father, that dad, that son, that daughter, that wife. I knew them. And there's her husband weeping or her why his wife weeping, his children weeping. Dad's gone, mom's gone. And we walk out that door, we put the casket in the hearse there, and we drive away, and the pastor is behind the hearse, and the family is behind him. I know exactly what's going to happen when I get to the cemetery. I know exactly what's going to happen. And I have always, of course, got to get to the casket and walk ahead of the casket to get ready to put the, the body in the ground. You look over, and there's the family weeping. Now, I know what I'm going to do after the final prayer. I'm going to walk over and I'm going to spend time with the family. But usually I'll look over and it'll be something like this. The church has already got gathered around them. After that, they will go to their home and they've prepared food. And they don't want the family to be alone. So they'll stay there and fellowship with, with those family members. God gave me the whereabouts to preach my father's funeral my mother's funeral my grandmother's funeral my aunt's and uncle's funerals he gave me the grace to do it you know why? because when I stood at the head of my dad's grave I knew where he was my mother I knew where she was and I knew one day I'd be there so here's these people weeping what am I saying? we need one another don't we? we need one another See, God wants you and I to make a difference in the lives of others. Uh, I'll get a note every once in a while or I'll get a phone call every once in a while and someone will say, Pastor, you've been a great blessing to me. Now, you know what that does to me? That just humbles me. I was going to be a farmer. I wasn't going to be a preacher. I had no, des no desire to be a preacher. Because I didn't think I could ever do that. Stand up in front of people and preach? I'd never do that. But I'm so glad I answered that call. And I love people. I do. Wherefore, seeing also you are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let me stop. Now look at me. Let's get serious a minute. Let's get serious. What is your, now don't, don't say it out loud, what is your besetting sin? What's mine? You know what it is. You're laughing. I, I can tell you know what it is. 
And it's that one that Satan just seems to get you with every time. But you know what the Bible says? Lay, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know why many Christians never succeed? It's because they do not see themselves in a race. Church is a game. It's a game. It's a plaything. Some men come to church because they want the power of being a deacon. They want to be, have a powerful influence on the church. I'm a deacon. I'm a this or I'm a that. You need to look at it like this. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a servant. God will use a servant. And I thank the Lord for our men. And I pray for them. I want them to know I pray for them every, every day. Now, if you're going to lay aside every weight, obviously we need to know how to do that. Now, when he says wherefore, he says, okay, what I want you to do is go back and study the life of the men and women in the Old Testament. That's basically what he's saying. They had victory. God gave them tremendous victory. Look at them. Look at verse 8 of chapter 11. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in the tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. They looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. Hey, they're in that city now. Got that? They're there. But there was a time they were on this earth. They were walking down here. They were looking for that city. They're there now. Now you and I are down here. We're looking for a city. And we'll be there one day. How did he do this? By faith. By faith. He looked for a city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. And then he just continues on talking about the heroes of faith. They are men and women of whom we learn from to help us to live that kind of life right now. Are we living unto God? Now last week I gave one point. A life lived unto God will be a self-denial life. Put that down. If you're going to live for God, you're going to have to live a self-denial life. I don't know how many times back through the years the phone has rang in the middle of, uh, rung in the middle of the night. Pastor, mom just went home to be with the Lord. This is a tough one. Pastor, our little Jimmy went to be with the Lord. Pastor and a daughter went to be with the Lord. Can you come? You get out of bed, you get dressed, you clean up, you drive to the home, the light is on, family members are there, you knock on the door and the wife or husband opens the door, there's tears in their eyes, and you walk in. That's not easy. You've got to be ready for that. Now you have to go in, as a pastor, you have to go in, and by the way, I've learned something. Sometimes you don't have to say a word. Just be there. Put your arm around that man, around that wife, or both of them. Sisters and brothers. That means a lot to them. That's why we have a church. That's why we have Gospel Light Baptist Church to help in those times. I don't know how many times someone's given me a call and said, Pastor, I want to put a little bug in your ear. Yes, sir, what is it? Yes, ma'am, what is it? I, don't, I know you don't know this, but one of our members, so-and-so, faithful to church here, they lost, and they'll go ahead and tell the story. They need financial help. And so I would immediately, when I get to church, call the deacons in 
and say, man, how much do we want to give and then take up an offering? And just about every deacon board that I've ever served with wanted to do the, their best to help those people. Well, let's give them this and then let's receive an offering and so forth. And I've walked into that house with a couple of deacons and walked up to the man and the lady and said, we heard you're having some problems here. And they'll look at you and they'll say, this, you're giving this to us? Yes. Think about that now. What does that do for a church? That'll bring you together. Always be alert to Satan or to uh, split a church. One little gossip gets started. One little rumor gets started. You know what I'm talking about? Because the devil does not want this church to be here to serve the community and to serve the lost world. That's the reason. And so we talk about this matter of a life lived unto God means self-denial. Secondly, a life lived unto God will be a misunderstood life. A life lived unto God will be a misunderstood life. Listen to 1 Peter 4.4. 4. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right, speaking evil of you. Let me say this to you. Everybody is not going to love you. Everybody is not going to speak highly of you. They're going to gossip. They're going to lie. They're going to do all kinds of things. And that hurts. Have you ever been hurt by a Christian that you thought was a fine Christian and they, they hurt you? That's not, that's not very good, is it? That doesn't feel good, does it? And of course, uh, here's the deal. You have to follow what the Bible says. I've learned that down through the years. So when I heard or it got to me that someone had been talking about me or spreading rumors or whatever it is, I uh, go to their house and knock on the door and I'll say, I need to talk to you. I always take one or two witnesses with me. And I'll say, now this is what I have been told from this person, that person, that person. Here are my deacons, here are my men here. They understand this, they know this, so talk to me. Now that's not easy. That's not easy. Now I brought all of that in to say this. We're a church. We're here to help one another. We're here to take the gospel to the world. Sometimes your conversation is going to be misunderstood. Now we need to stay away from idle words, amen? Stay away from idle words. And uh, sometimes our conversation will be misunderstood and the devil loves that. Did you know what he said about you? Do you know what she said about you? And all it takes is just a little clucking and then a little rumors and then there's a stir up in the church and the devil loves it because now there's a fight and maybe a split. I lived until I got married. I lived right down below, about 200 yards from a church. And it was a good church. But there started rumors. Rumors. And then one Sunday morning, I wasn't there, but the people that told me this are good people. Two deacons stood up they crossed across the aisle and before one man could get there he took his fist and hit him right in the nose. And there was a big fight that ensued among the deacons. Half the congregation left. I go back there when we go home and sometimes I'll see members of that church that are still there and I'll ask them questions and they'll say, we've never recovered. We've never recovered. They've never gotten over 40 or 40 people. You say, well, Brother Boofer, you're saying living unto God. That's exactly what I'm saying. 
you're going to be misunderstood by people. People are going to speak ill of you. Be very careful. Be in prayer. Stay close to the Lord and live unto Him. Live unto Him. I want to do something this morning. I've written out uh, some things that I want to just say to you this morning and then we'll close. I want to talk to you about seven dangers. Now, here's what I want to say. If you want to live unto God, and I'm not going to, now I'm not going to ask you your, to raise your hand, but here's what I want to ask you to answer in your own mind this morning, your own heart. <clears throat> Are you right now living unto God? And then this, do you want to live unto God? Do you really want to live unto God? If you do, and you set out to do it, then Satan's going to double and triple his forces. Look out. Now let me give you these to think about, okay? Write them down. Number one, first danger, don't ignore what God has done in Christ. Don't ignore what God has done in Christ. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the words spoken by angels were steadfast and every transgression and disobedient received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Now verse 1 again. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard. What's he talking about? What we've heard in the Word of God. The Word of God, what it teaches. And we need to not ignore what God has said. How much time do I spend in my Bible? Do I memorize verses? If a man came up to you this morning or a woman came up to you this morning, I'm just saying this, and said, God has really convicted me about my sin and I want to be saved. Will you show me how to be saved? Would you, would I know how to take my Bible and lead that person to the Lord? We need to be ready. The Bible says be ready at all times to give an answer to him that asketh you of the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Number two, first of all, ignoring what God has done in Christ, we need to pay careful attention. Amen? Pay careful attention to what God has said. Who He is, what He's done, and don't ignore the fact that heaven's watching. Don't ignore the fact that heaven's watching. We went back to Pleasantdale and God led Sue and I back to Pleasantdale when it was closed to open it, reopen it. One of the men that was there during the days it was going good uh, and the church, of course the church closed down. Well anyway, he came back to that church. And the church grew. It had a Christian school and so forth and so on. And I heard that this man was spreading rumors. So I got two deacons and I went to his home and he lied. And I turned to the deacons that were there and I said, gentlemen, what have we heard? And they told him. Well, buddy, that really upset him. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but the next Sunday morning he caused a real problem in church. And of course, we had a policeman and we had a sheriff's deputy as a member of our church. They went over to him and they said, now you can either leave peaceably or we'll take you out. You're disturbing public worship. He kept telling lies about the church. Just simple as that. 
Listen, it wasn't very long till on a Sunday morning I got a call and his wife said, Pastor, gave the name of her husband. He's passed away and gone to be with the Lord. I tell you that to say I have witnessed several times. You don't fool with God's people. You don't fool with His church. You better be careful. I better be careful to preach the truth and to do the best I can. Number two, here's another danger. Not believing what Jesus has said in His Word. We need to believe the Word, the word of God from cover to cover. Write down chapter 3. I won't have time to read all these verses. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through verse 14. See, believing Him needs to go into our heart. Have you got that? Believing God needs to go into our heart, not just our mind. In our minds and then into our heart and then into our life. That's what we need. Listen now, pray with me that when this thing is gone and we can get back out here knocking on doors, that we'll do that. I mean, we've got to get out here and reach the community if we want the church to grow. Number three, ceasing to grow. Ceasing to grow. Write down, if you will, Hebrews 5.12, Hebrews 5.12, Hebrews 6.11 and 12. Number four, not pursuing His holiness. Not pursuing His holiness. Chapter 10, verse 22 through 26, and chapter 12, verse 14. And then five, losing faith. I've had to deal with people like that. Chapter 11, verse 1. The, fifth, the sixth thing, rejecting discipline. Chapter 12, verses 10 through 11. You see, I've had an occasion to be involved in that kind of thing too where the person would not receive discipline from the church. And I've watched some very heart-sickening heart things happen because of it. And then the last thing, rejecting God's warnings rejecting God's warnings chapter 12 verse 25 of Hebrews verse 28 and verse 29 12 25 28 29 here are just seven dangers that can keep us from being a man or a woman whose life is lived unto God would you stand to your feet with heads bowed and eyes closed please Brother Jesse, you uh, come if you will, and our pianist uh, come. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Are you here today and you've never asked Jesus into your heart? I was talking to a man just a few weeks ago, and you know what he said? I don't believe there's a God. How do you know there's a God? And I said, well, let me just... Uh, say a few things to you. You think that uh, this earth came about by evolution. I said, let me, let me give you this to think about. There was a time in this universe when there was nothing but God. Nothing but God. He's always existed. The Bible says from eternity past to eternity future, from everlasting to everlasting, there is God. And then God decided to create and he created the heavens and the earth. And he created man. I can believe that far, far easier than to believe there was nothing and all of a sudden there was something. If that one time there was nothing, what caused the something? Amen? So don't use the excuses the devil gives. We'd love to take the Bible this morning and show you how you can be saved and how you can know it. Secondly, Christian, and I'm talking to myself, are you living unto God? Are you living unto Him? We need men and women that will live unto Him. I love this church. I love you people. I love kidding with you, but I want to be there when you need me as a pastor too. And I want you to know that we want to grow as a church. I believe you do. And I believe God will take care of us. Now, as the pianist will play in a moment and Jesse will sing and you want to sing with him with your heads bowed, you can, but I'd like for them just softly play and sing. If you need to come this morning and talk to God, do so. 
We got people to pray for you if you need that. If you don't need someone to pray, that's okay too. Father, have your way in this invitation. In the Savior's name, heads are closed, eyes, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The piano, the orchestra plays. Jesse will sing softly, give you an opportunity to come. Come for salvation, come for rededication, church membership, whatever it is.